Hello, good evening, everyone. Once again, my name is Ali Ahmedi, uh, consultant working with Tickmill on their webinar series for futures, the way futures are used, and the variety of sectors that they're involved in. And tonight's topic is an interesting, interesting one to me, specifically where are uh, getting out of, let's say, the mainstream of you know your gold, your metals, uh, oil, and so forth. And we're going to be getting into the agricultural sexual, uh, sector, specifically with wheat. And we will get started uh, into the series now. Now, uh, for those of you that have been following and joining along, uh, as you all well know, I like to keep things informal and in a conversational dialogue and format and try to relay and dissect information uh, in that way. Once again, we'll be discussing uh, the wheat futures and the particular outlook and forecast provided from several various uh, institutions and uh, financial firms. Now, once again, I find this topic or this specific, this specific commodity very interesting specifically because of the time uh, where we are right now currently with the market and the geopolitical tension um, with everything taking place in that aspect as well as what's taking place with inflation and the rise in costs uh, dealing with all commodities in general, but specifically this one, because um, it does affect uh, the population globally, since it is something that we consume as an edible and is needed uh, on a daily basis from a food perspective. Uh, this is taken from earlier today. Let me make this a little larger so that we can see. This is the June of 2022 futures contract um, where we stand right now it was priced at the time of this particular uh, slide at 846 uh, spot zero uh, you can see the trend uh, from May we had a bit of a spike and then since then it's been going downhill this is a snapshot basically of where we stand uh, as it was traded today. Now, if we look out into this particular, these two slides in comparison, these are the July 2022 and December 2022. So the current month that we're in, the contract and year ends contract. And if you look at the graph and the chart themselves, uh, you can see a lot of similarity with what they're projecting. Uh, the uh, uh, July 22 contract is priced in at, make it a little bigger, there you go, at 831 spot two, and the December contract is priced in at, just a little bigger for you, these are just conversation points before we get into what the forecasts and different organizations have to say. But the December contract is priced in at 862 spot 40. And one year from now, we're looking at this is the July 2023 contract. So 12 months out, it's priced in uh, currently at 875 spot zero. So looking at what's taking place in the market right now, we're having another bloody day. Yesterday was a holiday in the United States. Uh, the 4th of July was celebrated. So the markets were closed in the US, but today's opening is very bloody. Uh, everything seems to be down. Uh, gold, oil, and all the ind major indices are down as we're speaking right now. Um, so, it, it's continuing to provide this stress and, and pressure on, on the downside uh, across all sectors. Now, what we're gonna do is get into, before we come back to these graphs uh, and charts, is we're gonna get into different organizations and firms 
with their specific outlook for wheat specifically. This one is coming from, there we go, from tradingeconomics.com. Um, the Chicago wheat futures fell to $8.30 uh, $8 per bushel. Remember, getting back to in our previous webinars when we were introducing how futures are priced, uh, wheat is each contract is worth 5,000 bushels, et cetera, et cetera. Depending on if it's a large or a mini, you also have to take a look at the, at the, at the, uh, the chart and its tick value. But uh, according to what Chicago wheat futures, it fell to $8.30 per bushel mark, extending its recent slide to levels not seen since Russia's invasion of Ukraine as fresh USDA, that's the United States Department of Agriculture, planting data pointed to grain acreage and stock levels that were above market expectations. The data added to projections of higher supplies as North American farms are ahead of schedule into harvesting season. At the same time, a strong crop from Russia, the world's top exporter, pointed to a record amount of wheat available for shipment. Ukrainian grain exports for the first 22 days of June were 44% since shipments were halted back in February of this year. Now, the biggest wheat exporters globally are China, India, Russia, United States, Canada, France, Ukraine, Australia, and Argentina. Now, Ukraine and Russia, they both account for nearly 30% of the global wheat exports uh, combined before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Now, wheat is expected to trade at 854 spot 71 by the end of this quarter. And looking forward, we estimated to trade at 9.42, spot 73 in 12 months time. So we, at this quarter now, we're looking at July, August, and September, okay? They're looking at an 8.54 price target as their forecast. And 12 months from now, they're looking at a 9.42 price target. Well, if we look at the target or the actual where the futures are trading for July 2023, they're currently trading at 875. So if we were to take solely only this specific uh, 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 piece of data and research and say, okay, well, this could be a bargain. Let's buy now. We expect it to go up, you know, uh, a, a significant clip and we could make uh, a nice profit barring that this is accurate. Uh, but as we all know, and as I've mentioned in previous webinars, that we have to access and look across the broad spectrum of all what the market, the data, the research, and the analysts have to say, and we have to come to our own conclusions. Now, from uh, capital.com's website, um, as a result of the war in Ukraine, the sowing area was reduced this year, uh, sowing area was reduced this year, and the harvest is expected to plunge in 2022. Now, this is specifically related to Ukraine and its wheat market. Uh, for obvious reason, uh, reasons, uh, with them being involved in conflict with Russia, they're not able to operate on all cylinders as they would like to be, doing specifically when it comes to one of their major exports, which is wheat. So due to what's happening with Russia at the moment, they're not going to be able to produce as much wheat uh, as they would like to, which will have an impact uh, on the global wheat supply because they are one of the major exporters and producers of the commodity. But we have to keep it in context as we'll see in further slides. Now, from the uh, Dutch bank, Rabobank, as a result of tight supply, their forecast and analysts and outlook for the commodity is not as bullish compared to their previous forecast. Now, this obviously has a lot to do with what could happen with Russia, with them being a top exporter of 
of wheat, uh, how deep and how far will the sanctions run against uh, Russia itself, Ukraine itself not being able to produce as much as it would like, what kind of impact will that have on the market as well? But there are other major, uh, uh, let's say, providers of wheat, as mentioned, globally from India to China, Australia, Canada, United States, and Argentina. So we'll see if those exporters and producers will be able to fill the gap, so to speak, for the shortfall uh, that Ukraine will end up having and what ramifications will end up having with the geopolitical uh, sanctions and to what extent uh, will they play out on Russia's wheat uh, exportation for the coming months of this year and into 2023. Moving onwards, uh, this is coming out of uh, Sask Wheat, which is uh, the Development Commission out of Canada. Uh, wheat futures plummeted on a combination of risk off selling, a rapidly progressing U.S. harvest, and improved conditions in Canada, and questions about the demand outlook. World wheat futures fell to their lowest weekly close since the first week of the Ukrainian war. They note that new crop wheat fell more sharply than corn. You know, uh, we're staying within the agricultural domain here and it remains overpriced to corn. The big question currently is high inflation, strikes, huge government debt, threats of stagflation, and I'll get to stagflation here in a minute, and energy gouging have caused consumption comeback, uh, cutbacks to previous demand projections for the grain and oil seeds, which are overstated. Now, stagflation uh, very simply is, it gets to a point where uh, if we just take the US economy, for instance, where they are currently raising their interest rates to combat inflation, but at point, you know, stagflation, it, it is a possibility at some point in time where the Federal Reserve will say, you know what, we are not willing to go back to the Volcker days and hike so aggressively to get it to where it's uh, in the in the teen percentages uh, of interest rates to really fight head on inflation. And they might just throw in the towel and say, you know what, we started uh, combating inflation a bit late. We're behind the eight ball here. Uh, we're only going to raise interest rates to a certain extent or to a maximum limit per se, and then inflation is going to do what it's going to do, and then it's just going to get stagnant, where inflation is at you know, a specific range higher than where it's wanted to be, and interest rates will cease to increase to combat that due to economical pressures, political pressures, et cetera, and then you get that stagflation. That's what they're referring to and stagflation. But if you look in the first paragraph here, you know, US harvest is on par. They're ahead of schedule. They have things moving on all cylinders. Uh, but the sell off has been clumped in, so to speak, with the overall market sell off. Uh, the market decline, the SP down today 57 points. It's down over 20% year to date and forecasted or projected to continue its downward pressure or, or sell off uh, throughout the remainder of this year. Now, Q1 2023 and Q2 2023 will be very, very important, will be in a very, will be a very important time frame to take into consideration regarding with what the Fed will do, the Federal Reserve out of the US. Uh, are they going to continue to fight inflation head on uh, or are they going to throw in the towel and start focusing on political reasons uh, because 2024 is an election year and uh, try to make the economy, uh, prop up the economy back up again, which right now, uh, in my opinion, as again, uh, this is not 
investment advice, this is my opinion, is, is, is very dangerous. We're in a very volatile and on thin ice regarding the overall market outlook, uh, regarding how much money has been printed from the Federal Reserve, how much debt is out there. Uh, geopolitical tension is at an all time, well, I shouldn't say at an all time high, but it is at a very high level since the uh, 70s. Uh, and the overall market sentiment from the ability from the U.S. being the wealthiest nation on earth, savings levels by uh, households have decreased. Uh, credit card debt is increasing. Uh, the U.S. debt is increasing. Uh, Jerome Powell, the, the, the Fed Reserve Chairman himself, um, earlier this year was very concerned at the national debt being at plus or minus 25 trillion. And since then, we're above 30 trillion and counting. So uh, it, it, it's a very, very uh, difficult and volatile market to be uh, very wary. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't be involved, but if you are involved and or are going to be involved in the market, specifically with futures, they can be advantageous in these types of market conditions because with volatility comes opportunity. This is coming out of Reuters. Relative to estimated global demand, wheat supplies for the upcoming cycle are seen uh, dangerously close to all time lows and notably below this year's reduced levels. When excluding China, World wheat stocks to, use, stocks to use for 2022 and 2023 falls to the 14.9% level this year, and it would be the fourth lowest ever. The record of 14.3% was set back in 0708, and the average from the mid to the last decade was at 19%. So what they're saying here now is that the, the uh, supply or the upcoming supply is decreasing and they're excluding China, we'll get to that in, a, in, in, a, in later slides, um, is down. And for the last decade or so, it's been at 19%. Now it's at roughly 15%. So it's, it's down. And this could keep white wheat prices elevated into 2023. So if you have less wheat, the demand is always going to be there because of what it is. The commodity is needed globally, whether you are an exporter or importer, all nations need it. Um, impacting food prices for consumers globally and ensuring continued high, higher cost at, for the importer countries. Ukraine situation also brings great uncertainty to the wheat market as the Russian military still occupies parts of the country country, uh, country. Uh, and then again Ukraine being a top five wheat exporter. Now China is which is often excluded from the global grain analysis due to its stockpiling habit is later to have a record 53 percent of the world's wheat storage by mid-2023. Now China they don't include them in most of their analytical data because they stockpile and they hoard and they can manipulate the data of how much wheat that they have stockpiled. So there is always that gray area of how much do they have, how much have they produced, how much have they exported, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, most of the analysis when it comes into factoring in forecast, they often exclude China out of the equation. But if you look at that staggering number of 53% of the world's wheat storage by mid-2023, you're talking over 50% of the global market need that they would be able to supply if needed, uh, depending on how things play out with Ukraine, Russia, and the US economy, uh, as well as the other major exporters being France, Argentina, uh, and Australia, as well as Canada. So uh, this is something to take into consideration. This is coming from the United States Department of Agriculture, otherwise known as the USDA. 
the U.S. wheat production uh, is forecast at 1.737 billion bushels, which is up 8 million bushels from the May forecast and 6% higher than the previous year. On Thursday, July 1st, this is just this last Thursday, just a few days ago, the USDA pegged the world wheat ending stocks for the 2022 and 23 marketing year at 267 million tons, a six year low, well below analyst estimates of 272 million tons. Now a note to take into consideration, uh, almost two months ago now, in its World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates report, they supported a bullish outlook for the 2022 and 2023 commodity with reduced supplies and higher prices. So if you take that bit of information combined with what they just came out with uh, last week, uh, with it being at a six year uh, at a six year low below their forecast, well, that's naturally going to cause the the price to go higher, uh, and the demand will always be there. This is from Wallet Investor. Uh, uh, once again, they're an algorithmic-based uh, management uh, firm. Uh, their wheat production, for the most part, if you've noticed throughout when we uh, started getting into market outlooks, specifically with gold a few weeks back, uh, or oil a few weeks back, gold last week, uh, copper, uh, they've always been bullish. And they're, always, they're, they're bullish here with wheat oil. Their projection in 12 months time is at 970. Um, I'll go back to a previous slide with, with one of the forecasts for 12 months time, I think it was at 942. And if we look at you know, the actual futures contract for July, 2023, it's trading at 875. So if you've done your, if you do your research and you are involved in this specific commodity or using it, to either speculate or hedge and, and you come to the bullish mindset, well, the forecast one year out being 940 to 970, well, the futures contract here earlier today was trading at 875. So there is an opportunity there if, if they are accurate or even close to being accurate. Getting back to wallet investors, uh, the wallet investor, their five-year forecast uh, puts it all the way up at 1448 spot 35. So that's extremely bullish from where it's trading now. I mean, it's, it's uh, almost double. And uh, once again, depending on your own uh, dynamics and how you're digesting and, and uh, relaying this message, that the, this research internally yourself, if you come to the conclusion that, you know, wheat is a good opportunity now because of the sell-off uh, and enhanced sell-off due to the markets being sold off and it's being plumped in uh, based on US data, they're in, in good shape. Uh, China uh, stockpiling, um, Canada's report somewhat positive uh, from a from a harvesting perspective, uh, but then you you have the unknown coming from two of the top five exporters being Ukraine and Russia, uh, which those will remain as an unknown variable uh, at least today and for the foreseeable short term future until that conflict is resolved. Nobody knows how long that will continue to play out, uh, but this is a very So, the, the market uh, getting into bear territory, uh, recessionary territory, bear market territory, high inflation, uh, and then the unknown coming out of China. It's very difficult for analysts in general to come out with a longer term or 
mid-range term, you know, 2025 is two and a half years uh, to three years out, uh, they'll be reluctant to provide uh, any type of forecast or expectation that far out. Um, moving on, the key takeaways from the market overview in general, as I said, this is a very interesting topic to me uh, due to everything that's taken place in the market. And as we've seen from various analysts, the wheat market seems to range from being well supplied in 2022 to dangerous lows heading into 2023. And then coupled with the market sell off and the supply chain disruptions, there's a lot of selling pressure at the moment, which we've already discussed. Even though a rise in demand is present and needed mainly from importers, the supplies available, including China's stockpile, the geopolitical quagmire will be difficult to sort out in the short to midterm future. So uh, there are a lot of moving parts that nobody really has an answer to. And if anyone comes out and says, no, this is 100% accurate, this is what's gonna happen, be very wary of these type of analysts because there are too many moving parts and it's above a lot of people's pay grade and uh, knowledge grade uh, sensitivity uh, to geopolitical information, et cetera, et cetera. So again, what do we have to do? We've got to do our research. This is a good opportunity in my opinion uh, with the current market sentiment where the market is and what wheat actually is and what it what it uh, uh, what it provides what, what you know because it's needed it is a commodity that most if not all of the world is an importer you have several major g7 to g20 countries as exporters uh, that that provide the the globe itself with wheat and it is a necessity when it comes to, to consumption, when it comes to food consumption. And so the demand will always be there. It's just a matter of finding the right time using chart analysis on historical data, looking at the current sell-off. If you we go back and look at the charts that I've pulled up on where June's future contracts were traded, where July and December contracts are trading at and when you're out, you know, it's just a very, there's a decline in all of them. And it's, you've got all these red candles going down, uh, but how far down will they go? That's not known, but if you understand the dynamics of the necessity of the commodity itself, uh, this is a perfect opportunity uh, to hedge, take a position, and and uh, most likely and hopefully profit from in the future, uh, but being wary of what happens if uh, you know the geopolitical tension between Russia and Ukraine resolves overnight. Well, Ukraine goes back to being a top five exporter. Russia, depending on if they're on, under sanctions or not goes back to being a top five exporter, uh, then the market will see uh, enough or even more supply uh, to handle the demand that's needed from importers, which could further uh, put uh, selling pressure on the commodity itself. It's already seen selling pressure in, the, in, the re in recent months. Uh, but if things stay heated in the market, uh, with the downside pressure, uh, we could easily see the higher costs come into play and the demand for wheat, wheat will always be there as mentioned, and it could drive these prices back up very quickly. As always, I like to end with a quote uh, from famous investors. You get recessions, you have stock market declines. If you don't understand that's going to happen, then you're not ready. You won't do well in the markets. This is coming from Peter Thiel. He's a famous American investor, mutual fund manager, and philanthropist. Um, this is exactly where we are right now. We are heading into a recession. 
Uh, we're in recessionary territory. As I mentioned in, last webinar, in the last webinar, that recession data uh, has a lag and you've got to wait two quarters on GDP uh, reports to actually confirm if we are in a recession or not. But if you just look at where the market is now, and you, there is a different feel. This is not the COVID pandemic crash um, that lasted for a couple of months because everybody was in a pandemonium and not knowing what's going on. Uh, this is different from uh, the, the housing bubble because it was it was isolated, even though it was a massive bubble with the 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 uh, the housing crisis of 08 in the United States. Um, it was pretty much pegged into one sector and you had a lot of fraudulent activity. The bubble expanded and when it popped, it almost created uh, very closely uh, to a full financial collapse without uh, government intervention, um, which came into the in the form of TARP, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, where they doled out billions and billions of dollars to financial institutions so that they could stay uh, liquidated and, uh, or stay liquid rather, uh, in order to, to stay viable. Now, what's happening now is not just one thing. It's not just one bubble. It's an all-consuming type of bubble. You've got an overheated stock market You've got interest rates increasing, you've got inflation, you've got geopolitical tension, and then you've got, uh, in 2024, a, uh, a, uh, a presidential election in the United States. So there are, there are a lot of factors that are factoring in to what's taking place for us just to say the market is having problems because of for instance, the housing crash. Um, if you go back to that time frame from 09 until now, we've had nothing but a bull market except for one year in 2018. And that year, the market was only down 5%. Uh, so, you know, they, they, we do have to be very wary. And you have to understand that when you do have the market declines and we're in recessionary territory, that doesn't mean you should be. Uh, out of the market is if you're in the market, you need to be more astute, be more aware of what you're doing within your portfolio and at the same time, uh, understand where you can make specific position, uh, take, take specific position and make specific plays uh, within your portfolio that could pay off uh, very well uh, yeah, for you in your profitability column. With that being said, I'm going to open that up now to any questions. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to go ahead and uh, send them to me via chat. Have any questions? Perfect. With that, uh, the market is down today. NASDAQ just turned a bit green. Um, close to flat, but a bit green. It's turning around a bit, but for the most part, uh, it's gonna be a choppy week coming off of a holiday. So it's a short trade week. Uh, stay on top of the market, uh, do your research. And if you have any questions, as always, let me know. Until next week, have a great week. Good luck in the markets. And we'll, talk, we'll see you next week.